So pests and diseases, <clears throat> I really enjoy talking about pests and diseases. It's one of my, it's one of my pet subjects. And um, I like... I think I like getting the better of a problem, naturally and organically. Um, and, and the problem that you have, and I've, I've spoken about this a number of times, um, is that we all live a hectic lifestyle. Even us on the farm over here, we live a hectic lifestyle. It's, it's just constantly it's one thing after the next. And in town, I could only imagine it's even worse. Okay, and what happens is you only get to walk in your vegetable garden sort of late in the afternoon or it's been a hectic week and you walk in and Saturday morning's been a, a rush and it's shopping and it's kids and it's what, what I want. And then Saturday afternoon, you sit down and you go, let me go and see my vegetable garden. And you walk into your vegetable garden and it's just pests or diseases and you panic. And, and the problem with that panic is that the first thing that you do on Sunday morning, you can't come to me, I'm not open on a Sunday morning. You go to your nearest nursery, you go to your nearest hardware store, and you show them a photo and say, I've got this problem, I've got this hawker, I've got this disease. And the guy goes, oh, just take a bottle of this, spray it on, it'll kill everything. Am I right? It's a panic response. And the guy's not wrong. It will kill everything. And, and the problem that you have is that there's less than 2% of the insects in your garden are pests. The rest are just visiting. They're just passing through. Or they are actually beneficial insects. Whether it's a beneficial pollinator, whether it's a beneficial predator, um, they're beneficial insects. Less than 2% are pests. So when you spray whatever the kippy at the, at, the, at, the, at the nursery says you must spray, you're killing 100% of the insects. Where's the logic in that? Okay, and I'm going to run through a whole lot of things of it for you over here. So that's the first thing I want you to understand, is that not every hocha in your garden is a pest. That's number one. Okay, number two, if you want to fix your pest and disease issue in your garden... Spend money on your soil. If your soil is healthy, the plant is healthy. If the plant is healthy, the plant can resist pests and can resist diseases. You will find, and every single gardener will be able to identify with this. You will have a, a, a row, um, a row of, of tomatoes. And let's say you've got 10 tomatoes in the row. And all the tomatoes are great, and this one tomato plant, all the aphids are on that plant, all of the hochas are, all the diseases on that plant. Who's experienced that? Okay? Almost everybody's experienced that. And what's happened is, that specific plant is a disease plant. That plant probably has what I like to call plant diabetics. Okay? It's a, it's a plant diabetic. It's a plant that is actually a sick plant. And the pests will attack a sick plant before they attack the healthy plant. And what happens is, let's take aphids for example. So you've got your tomato plants, one tomato plant has all the aphids on it. And we often see it inside our tunnels. We'll, we'll be walking, we'll be scouting inside the tunnels. Plants are fine, plants are fine, plants are fine. And then we'll come across one variety of tomatoes. And the, that variety has white flower on it, or it has aphids on it, or has something. And that variety is susceptible to aphids or white fly, or that variety is actually a sickly variety. And we will do a couple of things depending on what, the, um, on, on what our outcome is. But it's the healthy soil that builds a healthy, robust plant. And the way that you build a healthy soil is by amending your soil with an organic mulch without digging it into your soil. Let the soil microbes break it down and take it down into the soil. That is the best way to amend your soil, is to increase the organic matter content inside your soil. The next thing is you need to nurture predators in your garden. So when I'm saying nurture predators, you want frogs in your garden. You want lizards in your garden. You want, um, 
You want shrews in your garden. You, you know what a shrew is. Okay, you want shrews. In, a shrew, it's like a little mouse like this, but it's got a very long snout. And it's got grotana. It's got big teeth. Okay. Mole mouse fell. No, a, a, a shrew, a mole. No, a shrew is called. It's a mole, but it looks like it's, it's, it's a mouse, but it's got this long little snout that's yes. like a mole. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we call them shrews. I don't know what they're called in Afrikaans. A mole mice. A mole mice, but they're small. Mm. And they're very aggressive. They're very, very aggressive. Oh, well, if they land in the pool, they're not so aggressive because they're actually very glad that you saved them. <laughs> <laughs> um, Parktown prawns. Who knows what Parktown prawns are? Who likes Parktown prawns? <laughs> yes, why do you like them? <laughs> the cockroaches, they, they are prolific and uh, vicious. Predator. Of cockroaches. I didn't know that. Okay, Parktown prawns, their number one diet. <laughs> I don't like them. So, yeah. Parktown prawns are your number one predator of slugs and snails. If you've got Parktown prawns, you have a slug and snail problem. Simple. So, you need to nurture the predators. If you go into our show garden, you see there's a row of flowers down the center of our show garden. Why do we have the flowers? To attract bees. To attract bees. No, actually, we don't want to attract the bees. We want to attract wasps and hornets and other predators into the garden. So the majority of adult predators, okay, well, not the majority of adult predators, but a lot of the adult predators actually drink nectar and eat pollen. Their babies eat other things like caterpillars. So you have hornets or wasps. And they'll do one of two things. A hornet or a wasp will actually sting a caterpillar where the caterpillar is and lay the egg inside the caterpillar. Or what it'll do is it'll sting the caterpillar and drag the caterpillar off to its nest and it'll make a hole in, inside a tree trunk or a hole inside the soil, put the caterpillar inside there, lay an egg inside the caterpillar and, uh, and then cap it. So the reason why we have flowers in all of our fields, if you walk down, well, you're not allowed to, but if you go down into the bottom of our field, you'll see every single bed of, or, or field, the center row is a row of flowers. And the reason why is we want, um, we want predators to fly over our crops to the pollination strip to feed, and when they're flying out, they're looking for wasps, uh, they're looking for caterpillars. And that's one way that we reduce our caterpillar problem on this farm. Okay, when it comes to pollinators, we're not big on pollinators. I've got a whole lot of beehives down there, and we only use bees to pollinate um, like things like sunflower and, 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 and cotton and rizal and crops that we actually need bees. We don't want bees pollinating our pumpkins. We don't want bees pollinating our cucumbers. We don't want bees pollinating our tomatoes. So our tomatoes are in isolation uh, um, tunnels. Our cucumbers... There's a video on, on, on YouTube on how we hand pollinate. We've got a team of people. That's their job is they hand pollinate. Currently what's happening is they are hand pollinating cucumbers in, inside our plastic tunnels. So um, we do a lot of hand pollination. And the reason why we do hand pollination is you guys want pure seed. Okay. So we're not big on pollinators. Um, but we do have bees. Because what uh, self-sufficient farm doesn't have bees? Cool. Proper cultivation methods. So everybody has been taught that to cultivate soil, you need to plow your soil and turn your soil over. And when you turn your soil over, what happens is you are exposing trillions, literally, and I'm not exaggerating, I'm probably underestimating, you are exposing trillions of organisms to sunlight. And when you expose those organisms to sunlight, they cannot tolerate um, ultraviolet light, and they die. So now you, you till your soil, you kill all of the soil microorganisms, you plant your crop, and the soil microorganisms have to rebuild their entire community. Because the guy that was 20 centimeters deep, that's where he lives. He's now exposed to sunlight, he's either dying in sunlight, or if you do like the Germans do, they plow at night. Okay, because the, the, the theory about plowing at night is not to save the soil organisms, but there are certain weeds that need light to germinate. 
Okay, and they've done a whole lot of tests. Yeah, absolutely. So if you expose um, uh, seeds to light, it's a, it's a germination trigger. Didn't know that. Okay, so they've done a whole lot of tests and they've actually proved that it doesn't matter when you, when you plow, whether it's, it's um, at night or during the day, your weed load is basically the same. Okay, <clears throat> prevention is always cheaper than a cure. And the problem with a cure is you normally do a panic cure. And when you do a panic cure, you spray the wrong thing just for the need to be doing something. And a lot of people will spray stuff, and we see it. If you, if you want to control certain insects, you use Nudisan. And the people go, I don't have Nudisan, but I've got Bioneem. And I've seen this. And I'm talking specifically about these two products. I don't have Nudisan, but I've got Bioneem. Let me spray the Bioneem because it might help anyway. And it's not going to help. There's a very specific way that Bioneem works to kill insects. Okay? And it's just, it's, 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 it's just wrong. So people have a need to be doing something to fix the problem. Even if they're doing the wrong thing, that is going to cause more damage in the long run. Okay. So, when we talk about prevention, we, on Living Seeds Farm, we are very strong on, on preventative pest and disease maintenance. So, we, we hang up a lot of traps. So, we will use traps as a monitoring process to understand what pests are coming onto our property. And these traps work in a number of different ways. I'll explain them to you now. So, we'll hang traps up so that we can monitor. We will also use traps as a mass trapping tool if required. We will release insects, um, whether it's wasps, whether it's mites, whether it's flies, whether it's ladybugs. Um, we'll release a variety of insects um, as a preventative measure. We very rarely release a lot of insects as a, as a, as a, um, as a mass control measure. Very rarely. The only time that I can think of that we use insect as a mass control is when we're trying to control red spider mite and I don't want to spray. Okay? And then we use the BioGrow product. So there's a whole range of BioGrow products. These are my four favorite BioGrow products. Um, sorry. And then we have these as well. So but these are my four favorite BioGrow products. What we will do with these BioGrow products is we'll, we'll use them. And you can use these BioGrow, mix them together. Okay? Any two together. It doesn't matter. You can mix any two together and spray them on your plants. The only thing that you need to remember is the one in the red bottle can only be sprayed when the sky turns red. Does that make sense? Sundown. Sorry? Sundown. Sundown, yes. When the sun touches the horizon, you can spray this one. And the reason for that is that it, it uses pyrethrum, natural pyrethrum, and the natural pyrethrum is destroyed by ultraviolet light. So if you spray it when it's sunshiny like this, you, you're literally spraying water on your plants. Expensive water. Okay. Woolworths water. Okay. So we will use these and a combination of these as things arise. And I'll run through a couple of scenarios for you now. Okay. All of these solve problems. They are not the cure. So you need to understand how this works. So, and I'll run through all of these quickly. So let's say we're using this trap to catch um, um, cutworm and and. Um, and tomato bollworm because we've got one lure that attracts cutworm and tomato bollworm and basically what happens is this lure let me just get it out here so inside here we have a little plastic lure that goes inside here and there's different lures that have different scents and what the lure does is the lure smells like a really sexy female okay you can kill any guy with sex Okay, so what happens, even insects, so what happens is we hang this trap up, we put water, a little bit of soapy water inside here, we put the female sex lure inside here, 
that smells like a female um, whatever pest you're trying to catch. And the scent is so strong that it overpowers <clears throat> the scent of the real females. Because it's a stronger scent. And the males go and they try and make this female. And they make the fe or they try and make the female and they fall down the hole into the into the soapy water. And because we are nice and organic, they die a very clean death. <laughs> in the soapy water. Okay? But this is a, a um, a sexual, so it's not going to catch all of the males because depending on which way the wind is blowing, it might. It, 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 if the wind's blowing this way, it'll catch all of the males down here, but it's not going to catch the males over here because the male over here can't smell this female. All of the males over here can smell this female. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's a tool that you can use. It's a, literally it's a tool, and it's one of the tools in your arsenal. The next thing is, we can supply hojas. So depending on the hojas, and let's, let's use um, these Spidex mites for, as an example. There's 10,000 mites over here. That's a lot of mites. Okay. You phone us up and say, oh, I've got, and it's, it's always, we get phoned up when there's a spider mite problem. So Spidex mites only eat spider mites, red spider mites, nothing else. They only eat red spider mite. So you phone us up, you've got red spider mite all over your plant. So we tell you, sir, please order Spidex, and please place three orders on our website. And in the comments on each order, say, this one ship this week. The next order ship in two weeks' time. The third order ship in four weeks' time. And you put the dates when you want them shipped. We ship these out every Monday. Okay? So... What happens is you go, oh, you know what, I'm just going to order one, hey? I'm not going to order three. Because it's not cheap. I don't know what it costs, but I know it's not cheap. Just give me a price there, okay? So this is not cheap. But it's also not expensive if you consider the amount of money you've put into your crop. So who likes cheeseburgers? Put your hands up. Who likes cheeseburgers? I'm talking Rocker Mama's cheeseburgers. <laughs> Okay, a nice Rocker Mama's cheeseburger. Not a double, just a standard Rocker Mama's cheeseburger. Everybody that likes him, put your hands up. Okay, keep your hands up, please. Who can eat one? Keep your hand up. Who can eat two? Keep your hand up. Who can eat three? There we go. Cool. This guy's exactly the same. Okay, so Spidex eats the eggs of red spider mite, it eats all of the instar larva of red spider mite, and it eats the adults of red spider mite. He likes the low-hanging fruit first. So he's going to start eating the eggs. So Mr. Spidex goes up and he sees a patch of red spider mite eggs, and he eats his five or six eggs for the day, and he goes, I'm duck. And he goes and finds a corner on the leaf, he curls up and he goes to sleep. The next morning he wakes up, he eats his five or six eggs. The next morning he wakes up and he, where he had 12 eggs, there's suddenly 20 eggs because all the adults keep laying the eggs. And what happens is he's fixated on eating the eggs because the eggs don't fight back. And the adult red spider mite keep laying eggs. They keep laying eggs. And they can never get ahead of the egg production of these red spider mites. So all he's going to do is he's just going to keep eating eggs. The eggs that he misses hatch into larva. He's not interested in the larva because the eggs are easier to catch. They just sit there. Okay. So, and then you phone me in two weeks' time and say, I bought this and I spent so much money on this and my red spider mite is still just as bad as it was. And I ask you a couple of questions and I tell you, this is what you need to do. I have told you this is what you need to do. Yeah, but, but, but. And this guy can only eat so many cheeseburgers in a day. And he's always going to eat the easy one first. So 100 cc is three, uh, 367 rand. So 300 and, 370 rand for 10,000 um, red spider mites. I think this is for a smaller package, so 2,000. Is it the 2,000? 2, 2, oh, so, yeah, so the Spidex comes in a, in a small one like this? The one. Hey, the middle one. 
There we go. So the spidex comes like this. This is 370 Rand and this is 2,000 red spider mites. The problem is when you see red spider mites on your plant, you probably already have 50 or 60,000 red spider mites by the time you see them. So now you're releasing 10,000. Let's say you go for this. You're releasing 10,000 of these to fight 50,000 spider mites. And these guys are laying eggs every single day. So how do we get ahead of the problem? And it's very simple. Those of you that have red spider mite every year, I can guarantee that you have red spider mite in a certain two-week period every single year it starts. Yes? Think about it. Hey? Am I right? There's a certain two-week period, red spider mite starts. I know red spider mite starts in this farm at the end of October. So how do we, how do we counteract that? We start releasing spidex in the beginning of October. So we release this in the beginning of October before we can see the red spider mite because the red spider mite are already there. We just can't see them. So you release these guys and you release three tranches and we don't have a red spider mite problem. Absolutely fantastic. So you spend the money before you have the problem. And this is where a gardening diary is so important. You write in your gardening diary, I planted this today, I planted that today. So you know what dates you're planting. You can write your, your, your rainfall in the diary. And it's very important to write your pest issues in your diary. Because you can go back this year, you can go back next year and say, okay, fine. This is where I'm getting red spider. This is where I'm getting this. Or another good example is... Um, False codling moth. So a false codling moth is, it's a, it's a small little moth like this. And it is South Africa's number one fruit pest. Number one. And most of you guys have never heard of it. Okay, it's our number one fruit pest. And how it works is it has something called alternate year severity. So what happens is one year there's minimal false codling moth. Next year... False Codling Moth International is hosting their convention on your property. Okay? And you just have False Codling Moth. The next year, no False Codling Moth. The next year, False Codling Moth. And it doesn't have to be one on, one off. It can be one off, two on, two off, one on. It's, it, it's, it's not really one on, one off. But it's called alternate year severity. That is the technical term for it. And we put our traps for False Codling Moth. So if you put out traps, if you have a chat to Christine over here, put your hand up. She will tell you, I have never seen false codling moth trapping the way that she traps. I think 99 in a night or something. Yeah, that was at the worst. At the worst. 99 male moths in a single night. That is one trap for monitoring. And that was a monitoring trap. In that situation, you go out, you buy 10 and you just put 10 traps and get rid of the males. The problem with false codling moth is that where Christine lives, she can have 11 generations of false codling moth in one year. Absolutely terrifying. And there's a number of ways that you, when you have an infestation like that, you need to do a couple of things. You can't do one thing. So you need to put traps up. We don't have a, a hocha for false codling moth. But the next best thing that you can do is get a couple of chickens or some ducks and put them into your fruit orchard. Because the false codling moth I'm getting sidetracked. The false codling moth, it's a, it's, it's, it's a little caterpillar that, that chews into your fruit. And if you see your fruit's got like a, like a sticky string coming out, that's false codling moth. It's not fruit fly. Okay? When the, when the grub is, when, when the caterpillar is ready to pupate, it comes out of the fruit, it, it spins a, a web or, or a, a silk thread, and it drops all the way down to the ground. It pupates, and the, and the pupa has got a sticky covering on it. So it rolls in the sand and now it's covered in grains of sand and you can't see it. Mrs. Chicken can see it. Mrs. Duck can see it. And she will go and she will flatten all of the false codling moth pupa that's inside your soil. Cool. So if you use these things correctly and when we say these things over here, this is, it's trapping, it's insects, it's... Um, it's organic chemical control and it's organic biological control. I'll talk about this now actually. So all four of these, this is what's called integrated pest management. 
One of them will help you. All four of them will fix a lot of problems for you. So the last thing I want to talk about is this. Okay, these two over here. So powdery mildew. Everyone's got powdery mildew right now. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Everyone has powdery mildew. Have you seen powdery mildew on our pumpkin plants? No. Do you know why? This. Okay, so this is disease pro. This is a fungus that eats fungus. At this time of the year, this is time for powdery mildew. Okay, you've all got powdery mildew. I don't have powdery mildew. And I don't have powdery mildew because we spray disease pro. This is a fungus that eats fungus. It eats powdery mildew. It eats both species of powdery mildew. And it eats multiple species of downy mildew. Absolutely fantastic. This is called pelos. And this is a bacteria that eats fungus. Powdery mildew and downy mildew fungus. So we've got a fungus that has your back, and we have a bacteria that has your back. And what we do is one week we spray this, and one week we spray this. One week we spray this, one week we spray this. And you can get to a point where you actually build a population of this where you can stop spraying. And we will probably stop spraying in the next week or two, maybe even three weeks. And our population is there. The powdery mildew spores will come in on the wind, because that's where it comes from. The powdery mildew spores come in on the wind. They land, but we've got a population of bacteria and fungus that just takes care of them without us having to worry about it. Fantastic. But you do the preventative maintenance first. You spray before you have the problem. Cool. So, let's talk about achojas. And when I say less than 2% of the, of the insects in... Um, in your garden or pests. I want you guys to list all the beneficial insects. And I'm talking about not bees. I'm talking about predatory insects. All the beneficials. Ladybugs. One. Spiders. Two. Dragonflies. Three. Hornets. Four. Wasps. Five. Yeah? Six. Spider. Spiders have been done. Okay. I'm not talking lizards. I'm not talking mice. I'm not talking. I'm just talking predators. No. <laughs> hey. Scorpions. Scorpions. Yeah, it's, it's an arachnid. It's actually it's, it's that's a good one. Scorpions are very good. I haven't got it on here, but that's a very good one. So we've got beetles. You have predatory beetles. Who's heard of an ascarid beetle? So the guys, um, and you normally see them in the low felt because they've been killed out over here. It's a long, flat insect. It's got legs and it runs very fast on the ground. And if you pick it up, it burns the living out of you. It's a millipede. It's not a millipede. Which one? Like friends of us in the zanine has. They fly as well. They can fly as well. And they've got like a red leg. Yeah. They're the ascarid beetles. The bombardier beetle. Mm -mm. So they're called bombardier ascarid beetles. These beetles eat shongololos. They are also the most susceptible to pesticides. It's taken us about six or seven years to get a population on Living Seeds Farm. Okay? And we see them infrequently. Because before we took over this farm, and we took over the farm 18 years ago, okay, the, the soil was absolutely dead. So you got beetles. Beetles eat eggs, they eat the larva of, 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 um, of pest insects, and they eat the adults of pest insects. You got bugs. So I've excluded ladybugs and, and, and bugs because bugs, there's a whole family of, of bugs. Same thing, they eat the eggs, they eat the larva, they eat the insects. You've got spiders. Spiders are absolutely fantastic. So a very good example is the, the manufacturer's instruction. This is a red water trap. I don't know why it's called a red water trap. Um, this is a red water trap. And the manufacturer's instructions is you, um, you put the lure inside here, you put water inside here, and you put it on the ground. And the first night we installed these traps into our tunnels, we put them on the ground, we, we caught like 20, 30 spiders. And I said, no, this doesn't work. 
Okay, I'm not catching spiders. Okay, and it's called bycatch. So you often catch bees inside here, but it's a case of in one trap you catch one or two bees a week. As far as the bee population goes, it's next to nothing. But when you're catching 30 spiders a night in one trap, it's a problem. So all we did was we lifted the trap about 40, 50 centimeters above the ground, and our spider bycatch plummeted. Okay, dragonflies. They catch flying insects. So spiders and dragonflies are, are, are not particularly particular as to what hojas they want to, they want to eat. But uh, they will eat a lot of pests. Lacewings. Who knows what a lacewing is? A lacewing is a tiny, tiny little muchy. So they, they sit flat, but their wings stand straight up like this. And they've got two long tails out the back. And lacewings, they... Their larvae are predators. Lacewings don't eat. The adults don't eat, but the larvae are predators, and lacewings will lay their eggs on plants that have aphids. You've got wasps, and you've got hornets. I explained to you about the wasps and hornets earlier. You've got ladybugs. So we sell ladybugs. Living Seeds was the very first company in South Africa to sell ladybugs. Coppet is the company that got it right um, to supply the South African market with ladybugs. And we released the ladybugs into South Africa with Coppet. Um, and that's cool. You can buy ladybugs and release them in your garden. We've done it in, in literally all of our tunnels. Flies. And you thought flies were useless. Hey? So, hey? No, not bromas. So the fly family is very large. Okay? You've got, you've got pests. You've got... Um, You've got plant pests, you've got animal pests, you've got house pests, um, and you have predatory flies that will eat insects. Then you've got robber flies, also a fly. So robber flies, there's a whole variety of species of robber flies, okay, and the robber flies will also um, fly and, and, and eat. They normally um, hunt actively in flight, um, and there are robber flies that actually um, hunt bees, which is... That, that's a bad hoverfly. I mean, robber, robber fly. You've got praying mantis. Absolutely fantastic. Love them. Muchis. You know what I'm talking about. Okay? We've got muchis that are predators. So, aphidend, the scientific name is Aphidiolites aphidiomyza. This is a muchi. And what this muchi does is the muchi lays its eggs on a plant with aphids. She will not lay her eggs on a plant that hasn't got aphids. She lays her, her eggs near the aphid colony, and this little muchi larva hatches. So the, the adult muchi doesn't do anything, okay, besides lay eggs. The, the larva, it, when it hatches out, it goes for the baby aphids. And it bites the baby aphid on the kneecap and injects a toxin into the aphid, which paralyzes the aphid. And then it sucks all the juices out. And it'll repeat this constantly. And what happens is, if there's a massive aphid population, these things go on a feeding frenzy or a biting frenzy, where they just bite aphid after aphid after aphid. They just go mole. They don't eat all of them, but they paralyze half of the aphids, which is like really cool. Okay, mites. So I've spoken to you about the mites. We have a couple of different kinds of mites. This is a mite called Swirsky. Um, and the Swirsky mite is a, it's a, it's a, it's a broad, it has a very broad, it's got a very Catholic diet. Okay, and it'll eat, well, that's what it's called. It's a Catholic diet means a broad diet. Okay, so they'll eat, they'll eat eggs of pests. They'll eat the larva of pests. They'll eat the adults of pests. Um, and they'll eat, red, that, that they'll eat red spider mite, broad mite, um, uh, a whole variety of mite species. They'll eat um, white fly eggs, white fly larvae. Uh, so there's a whole variety of things that these guys eat. And the really cool thing about these is if they run out of pests to eat, they can survive on pollen. So they can eat corn pollen, they can eat pepper pollen, tomato pollen. And as soon as the pests come back into, the, into your crop, they'll switch from the pollen to the pest, which is really awesome. 
Cool. So when it comes to um, when it comes to predatory insects, it's not just ladybugs. It's not just uh, uh, praying mantis. There's a whole broad um, variety of pests. There's a whole broad variety of pests. And when you spray up a poison, you're killing all of these guys. And it's these guys that are doing the work for you. Over and above that, it's, it's, it's been worked out that a one hectare farm, a one hectare organic farm, gets 40 kilograms of nitrogen deposited on that farm in the way of insect poo every year. I mean, 40 kilos of nitrogen, that's good money. Cool. So your cover crops, like, like our pollination strips, your, your cover crops and your pollination strips provide a safe haven for insects. You really want the insects in your garden. Because only 2%, or actually less than 2% of the insects are a problem in your garden. All three of these over here, or all four of these, is not the magic cure. If you have a problem, it's literally too late. If you have a big problem, it's too late. If you pick up the problem right in the beginning, we can, we can fix it for you. So look at what your common problems are. You guys know what your common problems are. You know that uh, pumpkin fly is my issue. Red spider mite is my issue. False coddling moth is my issue. Um, um, white fly is my issue. And plan for it. Because you can plan for it and fix it before it becomes a problem. And the cool thing is, and it's, it's happened a number of times, where we've had a customer, and I'm, I'm talking a couple of years back, where we've had, I can remember two customers, where we coached them through the whole process, we said, this is what you do. And they did it for two years, and they said, oh, you know what, um, I, I don't know if it's actually working. I'm not going to do it this year. And like clockwork, they phone us and say, I made a mistake. I need to do it. And they, they keep doing it. And every year they try and, and or, or not every year, every couple of years they try and back off. And what happens is the problem just re re represents itself. And it's probably a deficiency inside the soil. Okay. Um, when talking about releasing insects, okay, you need to understand what kind of goal you have with your release because there's there's um there's a couple of a, a, a couple of ways of releasing you can do a mass release and you only do a mass release when you actually have a major problem and you really really don't want to spray so we've got a lot of the cannabis growers that um when they are just before harvest they can't spray anything on their harvest so they have to release um insects the problem is when they release the insects the insects are eating other insects and they're pooing on their very precious buds. So when you're smoking, you're smoking. <laughs> but yeah, so you have a mass release to try and solve a problem. It's always the most expensive. Mass release is always the most expensive because you're trying to get ahead of a population that is breeding, established, and it has eggs, first, second, third, fourth in star, and adults that you're trying to control. And sometimes... Depending on what pest and, and what predator you're releasing, the predator will only attack eggs and instars, or it'll only attack adults but not eggs. So it's, it just depends on what you're trying to release. You've got a sequential release, which is what, what we do, is we do a sequential release. I know that we need to start releasing at a certain time of the year, and every single year we just release the insects. Okay? Or you have a, a, a timed release where you go, I've got this environment, I'm growing 365 um, days of the year, it's a closed environment, and every single month you make a release. Whether you need it or not, you do a release. And those are the blueberry guys and the, and the guys like, um, that, that, um, that need to stay ahead of, of any issues, and they just release every single month. Blueberries are a very high value crop. It's a very high input crop. Excellent, guys. 
Talk to me about your pest problems. Because I'm done. I don't know how much longer we've got left. Minutes. 20 minutes left. Yes, young man, at the back. Can you do anything for mosquitoes? Can you do anything for mosquitoes? If you go into the shop, we've got a product. It comes in a little thing like this. It's called Moscow Kill. Okay, spray that where your mosquitoes are. Cool, it's a, it's a bacteria that kills mosquito larva. Yes, young lady. And termites. And termites. So termites are very beneficial for your soil. You actually want the termites inside your soil. It's a very nice question, young lady. What's your name? It's Laura. Laura, it's a very nice question. Thank you for asking it. So termites are actually good for your soil. It's beneficial for your soil. And you want the termites on your property. Because the termites are taking organic matter from, from the soil surface and taking it down into the soil. Termites farm fungus. And the fungus inside your soil is probably the number one indicator of soil health. Lots of fungus means really healthy soil. So now the problem is, I'm saying to you termites are good. How do we control the termites? Okay, Because we don't want to kill the termites. So the thing is, you need to change your mindset as to how the termites um, impact your property. And my advice to you is to take a couple of stumps. So you see that wooden stump over there? You take a couple of wooden stumps and you put the stumps down and that is food for the termites. Okay, so the termites now have a food source. And when they run out of that food source, that's fine. Put another one over there. And what happens is you reduce the termite load on your property because you're giving them a food source. And you know what? They feel comfortable with that food source because the food source is not moving. So they know they can mine this wood for years to come. That log over there also provides habitat for, for, uh, for pollinators. So we've got um, solitary bees. If you go into my show garden, you'll see we've got little wooden blocks with lots of holes inside them. If you stand very quietly and you watch the wooden block, you'll see little bees. And the little bees are going into the hole. And what they're doing is they're packing the hole with pollen and then they lay an egg. And they pack the hole with pollen, they lay an egg. And they pack the hole with pollen and they lay an egg. What is amazing, and this shows you how awesome God is, okay, is that the last egg laid hatches first. And the first egg laid hatches last. What? So the first egg hatches... It flies out, the next egg hatches, flies out, next egg hatches, flies out. Otherwise, the first egg that hatches first dies because he can't get past all of his monkeys. Cool. The, um, that tree trunk as well, or, or the cracks in the tree trunk will provide holes for, for insects to nest in. It'll provide holes for insects to hibernate in. It'll provide holes for insects to sleep safely in. So it's not just feeding the termites. Cool. Thank you, Laura. Yes? If I already have powder in your tube, yes. it too late for me to start um, on, the, on the... Disease Pro or the Pelos. Yes. Okay. So if you already have powdery mildew, it's not too late. So what I would do is, and I've got a video on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, uh, Living Seeds Farm, on powdery mildew, but I'll, I'll give you a, a, a brief um, outline of the video. The, fir the, the first thing you want to do is you want to trim all of the old leaves off the plant. So you'll see that you've got new leaves, you've got mature leaves, and you have old leaves that are looking a little bit like fillet. Okay. Cut all of those old leaves off, put them on the compost heap. Yes, I know they've got powdery mildew. It doesn't matter. The powdery mildew is all over your garden anyway. Okay. And the powdery mildew is coming in on the wind. Okay. So you can compost powdery mildew leaves. Don't compost virus leaves. Um, so, so clean off all of the old leaves because that's where the disease is going to start. Then what you do is you, is you get one each of these, Disease Pro and Pelos. You spray the top surface, you spray the undersurface. Next week you use the other one. Top surface, undersurface. Every leaf. Okay. Within about six weeks, which is, there's three doses inside here. One for each week and there's three doses for here, one for each week. Your problem is solved. Yes, sir. My spinach. Every year I have this little... Little round dots. No. Uh, yeah. I have to. But uh, it's like a... A ladybug. A ladybug. Well, it's not a ladybug. It is a ladybug. It is a ladybug. It is a ladybug. It is a ladybug. 
Hey? Thank you. Yeah. So it's not a good ladybug. No, okay. It's a bad, la but it's a ladybug. Okay. And then you see little worms with uh, lady worms? That's the baby ladybug. Oh, okay. And on the leaf stem, um, there's a, like a black spot or a brown spot. Yes. So that's called circospora. Circospora is a fungus. Copper soap will sort you out, but spray, it before, spray copper soap before you have the problem. With the... With the ladybugs, those are called potato ladybugs, okay? And what they do is they live on the kopis, just under rocks. And after the first rains, and you'll see after the first rains, potato ladybugs come out. And they, and they knock. Absolutely crazy. So those, those ladybugs, um, we spray a mix of pyrrole and nudisane, okay, to control those ladybugs. And... And you need to do it as soon as you start. So you'll see little clusters of, of yellow eggs. Those yellow eggs, that's their, that's their eggs. Those hairy alien-looking hojas, worms, that's their larva. And then you have the ladybugs. And these two over here will take care of them. Okay. Will bionine work nicely on those larvae? Yeah, the bionine works nicely on the larva. So how bion... So, Neem oil. Every second post on Facebook. Use neem oil. It cures everything. Rinda pest. A horrible mother-in-law. The whole trip. That's true. Hey? That's true, yeah. I mean, everybody says neem oil. So, the most important thing with neem oil is there's an active ingredient. And the active ingredient is called azadirectin. And how azadirectin works? It works, it, it, it works in three ways, but two of them are linked. So, the first way that it, it works is that it's a feeding inhibitor. So, it has to be ingested. Bioneem will not work. You can spray bioneem all over the insect. The insect's going to go, hey, that's cool. Check it my hair. Okay? Because Indian ladies use neem oil to make their nice glossy hair. That's what neem oil is for, but it doesn't have as a directin in it. So, that's the first thing. There's neem oil. Is, is, sorry. Is, it's a feeding inhibitor. So the insect needs to eat the, the, the neem oil to ingest it for the azadirectin to take effect. So if the insect is not eating your plant, you can spray neem oil on the insect's going to have beautiful hair. When it goes out on its date, it's going to be very happy. Okay, so number one, it's a feeding inhibitor. Number two, it's a hormone disruptor. So, and this works in two ways. It's anti-Viagra for insects. It stops the sex cycle. So the insects stop breeding. And the second thing is, it's a hormone disruptor that stops the insect metamorphosizing from one instar to the next. It's unable to complete the metamorph metamorphosis metamorphosization metamorph metamorphosis, metamorphosis process. Thank you. It's unable to complete the metamorphosis process. And it dies in its instar. But the neem has to be ingested. So if it's not an insect that's eating the plant, don't waste your time on, 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 on bioneem. How do you tell if bioneem or if neem oil has azadirectin or not? The first thing is, does it say it's got azadirectin? If it's got azadirectin, it probably has azadirectin. I don't think people are going to be putting it on as a lie. Well, actually, I suppose maybe. Okay. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, if somebody says to you, Take neem oil and soap or dishwashing liquid and mix the two together. You know that it hasn't got as a directin because what they're doing is that the neem oil actually does nothing. What the soap does is the soap actually suffocates the insect. So insects down their sides, they have a, a line called a lateral line. And that line has spiracles. And this is how the insect breathes. It hasn't got lungs. It breathes through these spiracles. So what happens is um, when it's nice and sunny, it's all great. The spiracles are open. When it starts raining, the insect closes the spiracles. But it can't close the spiracles completely. But the drops of water, the surface tension on the drop of water, the drop of water is too large to go into the spiracle. So this insect doesn't drown, but it's still able to breathe. When you have um, soap in water, 
Who remembers the paper clip test in school with water? You put the paper clip, so you have a glass of water. You can, go and tr you can literally go and try this at home. You have a glass of water, okay, and you fill the glass of water up. You take a paper clip and you bend one leg up. So the paper clip is facing down, and you float the paper clip on the glass of water, on the surface of the water. I promise you it'll float. Okay? Then all you do is take your finger and take a little bit of dishwashing liquid and just touch the water with the dishwashing liquid, and the paper clip will fall through the water. And what, water, what soap does to water, it, it, it reduces the surface tension of the water. So it drops the viscosity of the water, and now the water surface tension, the water can get through here and drown the insect. And that's how soap in, in pesticides work. And you see all of these recipes on the internet. Put soap and three cloves of garlic, and I mean, I, I saw one guy, he posted a thing where it's like you take, um, you take chili and it burns the insect's mouth, and you put soap in the plant, and the... And the and the insect slips off the plant, and you do, and it was like, I read this, and I thought, dude, where did you make this up? And this is advice. This is advice that people are giving out. Okay, homemade recipes, be careful of homemade recipes, because especially homemade recipes that contain oil, the oil actually creates little um, magnifying lenses, and it can burn your plant. Even, even, bio, um, yeah, even bioneem, okay, even bioneem will burn your plant if you use it at 100% dose and it's full sun outside. You'll see whenever we talk about using the BioGrow products, we always say 50% of the recommended dose. And there's a fat story behind that, but I'll, I think we're running out of time. One last question. First, yes, ma'am. We actually have little black spots that's raised on our stage. What could that be? It, it looks like it was bitten and then it was swelling or something. Do you want to send us a clear photograph, but like a, a, a nice clear photograph? Please. Cool. Christine, I saw your hand go up at the same time. <laughs> Last question. Very good question. Swiski and Spilex, do they breed once you... Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So these guys will breed. All of the insects that we supply, the insects will breed. The majority of them die out at the first frost. You have to reapply them the following year. If you don't have frost, then you're lucky. Excellent, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming out today. I hope you guys had an absolutely awesome day. Thank you for great Absolutely. Please, um, those of you that are driving long distances, Kimberly, I Pray safe travel mercies on you guys, but on everybody. Get home safely. Drag the, 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 the caterpillar off.